In chapter 9, section 4, we want to look at valence bond theory. In valence bond theory, a valence orbital on one atom overlaps with a valence orbital on another atom to make a bond. The overlapping orbitals must be singly occupied, so they must each have one unpaired electron for the bond to form. Here is an example. If we've got hydrogen with a 1, uh, 1s1, so there is just one electron in the 1s orbital there, so that one's singly occupied. And then with chlorine, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. And with that 3p5, that means, well, there's three orbitals in the p subshell. That means that one of the orbitals is singly occupied. The other two were doubly occupied, but one of them is singly occupied. Well, that one orbital that's singly occupied can overlap with the, uh, with the 1s orbital on hydrogen. So uh, there's a couple of possibilities. We can have two hydrogen atoms uh, where they overlap. Again, uh, the, the orbitals have to overlap to some extent to make a bond. Here we can get overlap between the 1s orbital on hydrogen and one of that, that 3p orbital on chlorine and, uh, and overlap and get a bond there. Or we can have two chlorine atoms that and their uh, 3p orbital uh, can overlap. Their 3p orbitals can overlap. So we can, we can almost always, always really, explain covalent bonds in terms of what orbitals are overlapping when we make the bonds. So as far as the overlap is concerned, the better the overlap, the stronger the bond is going to be. And you want to have as much overlap as possible without getting too far. Because if you get too far, then the nuclei have a positive charge and they will start repelling each other. So you do want to get the perfect balance between the attractive and the repulsive forces. And as I mentioned, if they get too close, then the internuclear repulsions will cause them to push away. This is a bond energy diagram that shows the bond energy as a function of how close the nuclei, nuclei are. At infinite distance, we will find that uh, that the atoms are, uh, since they're infinitely apart, their orbitals don't overlap at all, and we don't have any bond energy. It will be at this zero energy. As the atoms get closer, their electrons start to overlap some, and we stu do start to get some benefits, some bonding because of that, and as a consequence, we'll see the energy of our system will go down. Uh, it will continue to go down as the overlap improves, and at some point we will get the optimal amount of overlap. It'll be at this minimum down here. We'll get the optimal amount of overlap, and if we go any further, we're going to find that the internuclear forces are uh, are picking up too much. So we get too strong of the in too strong of a repulsive force between the two nuclei, and they get further apart. This is the diagram for hydrogen. Uh, there's two bits of information that you can get out of this diagram, and that is one is the bond energy. The bond energy is the difference between the zero energy and the bottom of that curve. In this case, it comes out to negative 300 or negative 436 kilojoules per mole. That means the bond energy is positive 436 kilojoules per mole. The other bit of information that you can get is the distance, uh, the bond distance. And that's the distance between the y-axis and this minimum, this where the dotted line is. And, and, and again, that is going to be our bond distance. So what we'll find is that the molecules do vibrate back and forth uh, um, uh, over that distance. So on average, it's at that distance. All right, so the next thing that we want to look at is hybrid orbitals. So the valence shell electron pair repulsion model correctly predicts the shapes very well. It, 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 it predicts the shapes of the molecules quite well, that the electrons want to get as far away from each other, electron domains get as far away from each other as possible, and, uh, and so it's a good predictor of the shape. However, um, but to get the electron domain geometries, we need to introduce 
the concept of hybrid orbitals because our orbitals that we're used to seeing don't make any sense to make the shapes that we have uh, over here. Like tetrahedral, how would we get tetrahedral from orbitals that look like this, an s orbital and some p orbitals? Well, in order to do that, we need to mix the orbitals. So, uh, so hybrid orbitals are formed when we mix atomic orbitals to create new equal energy orbitals, or as we, re we call them, degenerate orbitals. One important concept, however many atomic orbitals mix together, that's how many hybrid orbitals we're going to have. So if we mix together two atomic orbitals, we'll have two hybrid orbitals. If we mix together three, we'll have three hybrid orbitals. So to do this, I have an over-animated graphic, but I really like this, so I, I've decided to keep it. Um, so this is called the uh, linear electron domain, and it's going to be sp hybridized. We know that beryllium is capable of making a linear molecule. We saw the very first problem on the in-class assignment was BeCl2, and the BeCl2 uh, uh, had two bonds, and it was the linear electron domain geometry and linear molecular geometry. If we look at the electron configuration for just beryllium, it doesn't appear that beryllium could make any bonds because remember, in order to make some covalent bonds, we need to have some singly occupied orbitals. Well, here we don't have any singly occupied orbitals. So we need to take we need to fix that. And the way that we can fix that is we can take an electron from the 2s level and promote it up to the 2p level. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I've promoted it up to the 2p level. All right. And now that 2p orbital is going to decrease in energy, and the 2s orbital is going to increase in energy, and they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And so here we go, they meet in the middle. So now we're going to have, uh, we're going to have what we refer to as sp hybridized orbitals. These two orbitals are degenerate, they're the same energy, all right? Uh, these two orbitals are, uh, they are a different shape than the s or the p, and I'll show you what they look like here in a minute. Uh, and you'll notice that the two p orbitals that are up here, they remain there. They are unhybridized, so they are still there. And that the fact that they're still there is part of the reactivity of beryllium. So the way that sp orbitals works, uh, the way that sp orbitals work is that we are going to mix the s and the p uh, to yield two degenerate hybrid orbitals, as I mentioned. The s orbital is a spherical orbital, and the p orbital is kind of a dumbbell-shaped orbital. And so when we mix those together, we're going to get two sort of lopsided dumbbells. And the two lopsided dumbbells, these are the sp hybridized orbitals. All right, and so each one of those will have two lobes and a node, and they will... Uh, and they will overlap at that node, and we'll see that the lobes will arrange themselves so that they are 180 degrees apart from each other. And since they're 180 degrees apart from each other, that is the linear electron domain geometry. What this means, so here's the position of our sp orbitals. What this means is um, that any time we have the linear electron domain geometry, where we have two electron domains, it's sp hybridized. And if it's sp hybridized, then it's going to be linear electron domain geometry. All right, and then Bf, uh, BEF2, we had BeCl2 a little bit earlier, but it's a similar overlap. So the bonds, the, the bonds in between beryllium and fluorine are going to be the overlap of the sp orbital on beryllium and the 2p orbital on fluorine. And that gives us our bonds. So that is how our hybrid orbitals work. They change shape and they change their energies. Let's look at sp2 hybridized orbitals. And whenever we have trigonal planar, it'll be sp2. And whenever it's sp2, it'll be trigonal planar. We know that boron is capable of making boron trifluoride. Again, just look at the electron configuration on uh, 
look at the electron, or not the electron configuration, look at the Lua structure on your practice sheet, uh, num uh, B on number one, and you'll see that we can get three bonds in between boron, or we can get three bonds attached to the boron. Well, if we look at the electron configuration of boron, we'll see that we've only got one uh, singly occupied orbital. Well, to get two singly occupied orbitals, we're going to do something similar to what we did last time. We're going to take one of these electrons from the 2s subshell and promote it up to the 2p subshell. Oop. Not sure what happened there. All right, let's try that again. I, I hit a button on my computer and everything stopped. Okay, so uh, it went from the 2s subshell up to the 2p subshell. Now, the, uh, the 2p subshell is going to, these two orbitals in the 2p subshell are going to decrease in energy, and the 2s orbital is going to increase in energy until they meet. And we will get three equivalent or three degenerate orbitals that are called sp2 hybridized orbitals. The superscript indicates how many of those orbitals we shared. So uh, one is implied, so it's like S1, P2. That indicates that we have three orbitals that contributed to make these three hybrid orbitals. Again, note that the 2P orbital is still there. It just happens to be empty in this case, but the 2P orbital is still there. All right, and then those are the SP2 hybridized orbitals. All right. Yes, and then yes. Note the two p orbital is left unhybridized. For sp two orbitals, again, we've got a spherical orbital and two dumbbell shaped orbit orbitals. When we kind of average those out, we're going to get again kind of like with the sp orbitals, but we're going to find it's a little bit longer and uh, not quite as uh, rounded. So it's a little bit longer and not quite as rounded. So when we mix one s orbital and the two p orbitals, we'll get the three degenerate sp2 hybridized orbitals. They will always arrange themselves in the trigonal planar electron domain geometry uh, with angles approximately equal to 120 degrees. Now, let's look at carbon. Carbon, we know, can have four uh, uh, electron domains around it. If we look at part D on number one on the in-class assignment, you'll see methane there, and there are four bonds going to carbon. So we know carbon is capable of four bonds. But if you look at the ground state electron configuration of carbon, you will see that it has two unpaired, or, or two, yes, two unpaired electrons in orbitals. So you would think, well, maybe it can only make two bonds. Well, we're going to find that uh, we can increase the number of singly occupied orbitals by taking a 2s electron and promoting it up to the 2p level. All right, just like what we did before. And now all three of the 2p orbitals are going to come down in energy and the, uh, and the 2s orbital is going to go up in energy and they're going to meet in a new subshell that's called the sp3 hybridized orbitals. All right, well, those sp3 hybridized orbitals, now there's four of them, so there are sp3 hybridized orbitals. We will find that they will arrange themselves in a tetrahedral or, um, uh, configuration. So uh, when there's four, the 1s and the 3p, Again, we sort of get a lopsided, what looks like a lopsided p orbital. Uh, however, these are a little bit longer than the sp2 orbitals and a little bit less rounded. And as I mentioned, they will arrange themselves in a tetrahedral configuration. Now, I don't have cool animated graphics for the other ones, and it's probably just as well because it's complicated. Uh, but we have what we refer to, usually refer to as sp3d and sp3d2. So when we have the five electron domains, all right, that's a hypervalent. When we have five electron domains, we can get what is sometimes called the sp3d hybridized orbitals. Now, uh, there are people who will argue that the sp3 hybridized orbitals can't really happen, sp3d can't really happen because the d orbitals are too far away in energy to hybridize. 
that's probably true. However, uh, um, however, uh, uh, we'll just ignore that because this is the name that's mostly used. And um, in any case, uh, uh, and that, that's what we're going to refer to it as SP3D. So this will give us our trigonal bipyramidal electron, electron domain geometry. And then with six domains, we call them SP3D2 hybridized orbitals. And there they are. And you'll see that that will give us our octahedral electron domain geometry. Okay, so that is hybridization. So as far as our hybrid orbital summary, all right, so our hybrid orbital summary, the number of domains not only dictates the electron domain geometry, but it also dictates the hybridization. If you know the number, two domains, it's going to be sp hybridized. If it's three, it's going to be sp2 hybridized. If it's four, it's going to be sp3 hybridized. If it's five, it'll be sp3d. And if it is six, it'll be sp3d2. All right, so let's switch over to our in-class, and I'm going to move these models out of the way. All right, so indicate the hybridization and bond angles associated with each of the following electron domain geometries. So for linear electron domain, the hybridization, as we just saw, was S, P, and the bond angles are 180 degrees. For trigonal planar, it's sp2, and the bond angles are 120 degrees. For tetrahedral, it is sp3, and the bond angles come out to 109.5 degrees. For trigonal bipyramidal, we'll call that sp3d, and that has two angles. Our bond angles there are going to be 90 degrees and 120 degrees. Uh, remember the axial and equatorial. For octahedral, we'll call that SP3D2. And that we will refer to as our, uh, let's see, that one's going to have angles of 90 degrees. All right, so you want to be able to just memorize that and, and, uh, and know the connection. So now for each of the following bond angles, we want to give the number of electron domains. So for example, on this carbon, we'll give the number of electron domains. Once we know the number of electron domains, that will give us our electron domain geometry. It also will give us the hybridization of that atom. And we're going to guess the approximate bond angle uh, um, to the sort of idealized number. So this carbon has one, two, three, four domains. So we'll put four there. And with four domains, our geometry is tetrahedral. The hybridization with four is sp3. And the approximate bond angle will be 109.5 degrees. If we look at this oxygen, we've got two single bonds and two lone pairs. So again, we'll have four domains around that oxygen, which means that one is also tetrahedral. And this is also sp3 and also 109.5 degrees. For three, we've got three domains. Those three domains are going to come out to, uh, let's see, the three domains means that is going to be trigonal planar. The hybridization is sp2. And the approximate bond angle is 120 degrees. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit different than 120, but it's going to be pretty close. All right, with the number of domains here is 3 on this one. So we've got a double, a single, and a single. That's three domains. So again, that's going to be trigonal planar, and that will be sp2 and 120 degree angle. And then our final one on this one, uh, this carbon, there's a triple bond and a single bond. That gives us two domains. Our electron domain geometry 
is linear. Our hybridization is simply SP and the bond angle comes out to 180 degrees. Okay, so we're getting into some fun stuff here. So now we want to look at multiple bonds. With multiple bonds, there are two types of bonds that we can have uh, when we have multiple bonds. Uh, two types of orbital overlap. We can have what is referred to as a sigma bond and what is referred to as a pi bond. A sigma bond, and we'll use the Greek letter sigma there, is head-to-head -head overlap. That's where you get overlap directly in between the two nuclei. And the electron density is has cylindrical symmetry around the internuclear axis. So cylindrical symmetry. All right, so that will give us our, uh, what is it called, a sigma bond. For pi bonds, so again, we'll use the Greek letter pi, uh, it has side-by-side -side overlap. So here we have two, we have a p orbital here and a p orbital there, and they're going to overlap above and below that internuclear axis. And that's that kind of overlap. I'll show you another picture, and I actually have a model. Uh, uh, again, it's one of these 3D printed models that I've, I've made. I have a model that I can show you. All right, so if you have a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, what kinds of bonds are present in those? Well, if you just remember that the first bond is always a sigma bond and any subsequent bonds are pi bonds, then it's easy to remember. So a single bond is always a sigma bond. So if you've got a single bond between any two atoms, then that bond is going to be a sigma bond. Double bonds, on the other hand, uh, uh, consist of one sigma bond and one pi bond. And triple bonds consist of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So again, if you just remember the first bond is sigma and anything after that is going to be a pi bond, then you will be able to remember this. All right, a double bond has one sigma and one pi. If we look at the, uh, if we look at the electron, uh, if we look at the electron, uh, um, what do you call it? The hybridization, Ugh. My, my brain got a little messy there. All right, so if we look at the hybridization of carbon on formaldehyde here, there's three domains. Three domains means that it's trigonal planar, and it also means that it is sp2 hybridized. The uh, oxygen also has three domains, two lone pairs, and then one double bond. So three domains means that's also sp2 hybridized. So uh, if we look at what the bonds are going to look like in formaldehyde, the carbon-oxygen sigma bond is the overlap of an sp2 orbital on carbon and an sp2 orbital on the oxygen. You'll see that the other sp2 orbitals on oxygen are lone pairs, okay? And then we have a p orbital that's perpendicular uh, to the sp2 orbitals. We'll talk about that one here in just a second. Oh, here we are. All right, the pi bond is the overlap of the two unhybridized p orbitals. There's an unhybridized p orbital on carbon and an unhybridized p orbital on oxygen, and they overlap above and below that internuclear axis. And then finally, our carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds uh, are the overlap of an sp2 orbital on carbon and a 1s orbital on hydrogen, and we get the same thing for that other one. We can look at uh, we can we can look at another one. This is called ethylene, and it turns out ethylene has a really there's a really cool animation. It's one of my favorite animations uh, uh, from this publisher. And let me see if I have it up here. I think I do. Yes, and I opened it in Internet Explorer. When I tried to open it in um, Chrome or Firefox, it gave me an error. And I think it's just because it uses flash or something really old. Anyway, in ethylene, 
right? In ethylene, each of our carbons is sp2 hybridized. And so there are three sp2 hybridized orbitals on the carbon and one unhybridized p orbital. So the purple ones are sp2 hybridized orbitals. You'll see that there's overlap between the sp2 on carbon and the 1s on hydrogen to make those sigma bonds. And then uh, right now, these are too far apart to bond, so I'm going to start bringing them th together. And as we bring them closer together, you'll see that the sp2 orbitals start to overlap. All right, and so now we have started the sigma bond. Now there's going to be an optimal bond distance, but, uh, but they, once they're close enough, we'll get a, a sigma bond. The pi bond is going to be formed by this unhybridized p orbital on this carbon and the unhybridized p orbital on this carbon. And when we bring it a little bit closer, we'll start to get overlap above and below that internuclear axis. And that is what our, uh, our, our pi bond would look like. All right, so that is what that would look like. Now, I have a molecular model of ethylene. That, again, this is one I 3D printed. Let's see. Come back over here. All right, and so our carbons are the black atoms and the hydrogens are the white ones. The, the blue in the middle, that represents the sigma bond. That's uh, the sp2 hybridized orbital on carbon overlapping with an sp2 hybridized orbital on the other carbon. And then we've got... Uh, P orbitals that are perpendicular to the plane of the molecule, and those P orbitals overlap above and below to give us this pi bond. And so that is uh, what the shape of ethylene sort of looks like. Uh, in reality, it's not quite this clean because orbitals are messy, right? Orbitals are, are waves, so they, they kind of spread out over distance. But this is a pretty good representation of what a, uh, of what uh, the double bond on the ethylene looks like. And then just as a reminder, the, the first bond, the sigma bond, that's one bond, and then both of these represent the second bond. It's not like there's three bonds here. There's two bonds, so one, two. And so that is ethylene. Go back to our presentation here. And now we want to look at acetylene. For acetylene, we've got uh, a triple bond, and that triple bond ha ha is one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So in acetylene, uh, both of the carbons are sp hybridized. All right, so the, the, the sigma bond is going to be the overlap of the sp hybridized orbital on carbon with another sp hybridized orbital on carbon and that will give us our sigma bond our carbon carbon sigma bond and then our sp hybridized orbital on carbon will our other sp hybridized orbital on each carbon will overlap with a hydrogen a 1s orbital on hydrogen to give us our carbon hydrogen bond there and then as we go uh, a little further down, we'll now get overlap above and below and in front and in back, and you'll find that these p orbitals are perpendicular, so these pi bonds are also perpendicular to each other. So again, the carbon-carbon sigma bond is overlap of sp orbitals. Uh, the two pi bonds are the overlap of uh, unhybridized p orbitals, and then the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds are the overlap of sp orbitals with the 1s orbital on hydrogen. Again, I've got a model here of acetylene, and this is one that I 3D printed and, uh, and made, okay? So the blue in the middle represents the sigma bond between the two black carbons. The hydrogens are out here on the perimeter, and then we kind of look at it from the end. We've got a pi bond and another pi bond that are perpendicular to each other. And you'll see that all four atoms are collinear, so they're all in a straight line. Pretty cool. We can also represent delocalized electrons on with pi bonds. 
and the orbitals, we can look at what that would look like. So here is um, here are some resonance structures for nitrate. And the resonance structures for nitrate, if you recall, uh, we've got uh, a double bond between carbon and oxygen, or nitrogen and oxygen here, another one here, another one there. However, the average structure, uh, um, the average structure has about one and a one and a third bonds between each nitrogen and oxygen, and so we can draw what an, a localized pi bond would look like. But in reality, the uh, pi bond is delocalized, so that electron density is spread out over four atoms. So that that's kind of interesting. All right, for benzene, we get something similar that happens. Uh, benzene, if we look at the structures of benzene, we'll see that each of the carbons is sp2 hybridized. Again, if you look at each of these carbons, there's three domains around each. So that's trigonal planar, and they are all sp2 hybridized. So all six of them are sp2 hybridized. That means that the sigma bonds between each of the carbons is going to be the overlap of the sp2 orbitals on each carbon. So the sp2 orbitals on each carbon. All right, and uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, uh, and then the carbon hydrogen, so there's the carbon carbon, is the sp2 orbitals. The carbon hydrogen bonds are the overlap of the sp2 orbital on carbon with the 1s orbital on hydrogen. And it turns out all 12 of those atoms are coplanar. They're all in the same plane. Perpendicular to these uh, sp2 orbitals are, are uh, some unhybridized p orbitals. And those unhybridized p orbitals uh, the unhybridized p orbitals will overlap to give us pi bonds. Now, if we were just to try to represent one resonance structure, we would draw something like this. We would see orbitals that look like this. And if we did it with this one, we would see orbitals that look like this. Uh, or, or this one, we would see orbitals that look like this. But for our resonance structures, we would find, uh, for our resonance structures, we would find that I'm sorry, our hybrid structure would show that these are delocalized. So we get electron density all the way around the ring. So I've got another model. This is one that I actually made. This is kind of funny. This is one that I made as a Christmas ornament. And I gave this to my family and some of my friends who are nerds. So that's why there's a hook on there, because it's a Christmas ornament. But uh, you can see we've got the we've got the sigma bonds between each carbon, and then our pi bonds are represented by the overlap all the way around. So it's a delocalized pi bond. On the other side, I made it green. Uh, there's no difference between the two sides. Uh, I made it green because you know it's Christmas. So anyway, so that is what our molecular model would look like. Our our again 3D printed made these from scratch. Pretty cool looking, huh? All right, and then yes, those pi bonds are the overlap of the six unhybridized p orbitals, and there we go. Oh yes, they're delocalized over all six carbons. All right, so now we want to look at our final topic, which is molecular orbital theory. And the key to understanding molecular orbital theory is to see it more than once. So I recommend that you watch this uh, uh, part of the video again. So watch it and then watch it again. So as we remember from chapter six, electrons act like waves. They have wave properties. And since they have wave properties, we need to think about, well, what kind of properties do waves have? Well, waves have peaks and troughs, and waves can, uh, they can, they can interact in two different ways. They can interact constructively, and they can interact destructively. So when we're looking at molecular orbitals, we're going to find that the molecular orbitals can have many of the same characteristics as atomic orbitals. So let's cover those same characteristics as the atomic, atomic orbitals first. One, 
that there are a maximum of two electrons per orbital. That's, that's still true. Electrons in the same orbital have opposite spin, and this is just the Pauli exclusion principle applied to molecular orbitals. Degenerate or same energy orbitals must be singly occupied first before being doubly occupied. That is Hund's rule. And when we're filling the electrons in an energy diagram, we start at the bottom and work our way up. So we start with the lowest energy orbitals first and work our way up. That's simply the off-bow principle. It applies to molecular orbitals as well. And our electron density can be visualized using contour diagrams like we have drawn for uh, some of this other stuff. There are some differences between molecular orbitals and atomic orbitals. Molecular orbitals represent the energy levels for the molecule, not just single atoms. So once you put those orbitals together, they become something different. You get molecular orbitals. Whenever two atomic orbitals overlap, two molecular orbitals are formed in its place. You get one bonding molecular orbital and one antibonding molecular orbital. So, uh, so there's sort of a conservation of orbitals. However many orbitals you put in, however many atomic orbitals you put in, that's how many molecular orbitals you're going to get out. The bonding orbitals are constructive combinations of atomic orbitals. As you recall, uh, uh, if you have two waves, they can overlap constructively where the peaks line up. And you can also get destructive interference. And uh, when you get destructive interference where your peak and your trough line up, then that is, uh, then that is uh, anti, we're going to call that an anti-bonding orbital. So to the extent that you have electrons in bonding orbitals, you get bonds. To the extent that you have electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, it cancels out the bonds that you got from the bonding orbitals. So we want to look at, uh, so hydrogen, uh, uh, I didn't mean hydrogen bonding, I meant hydrogen ant bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals, I, anyway. All right, so we have bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals for hydrogen. If we get overlap directly between orbitals, a bonding molecular orbital, so if this is for hydrogen, so hydrogen has 1s orbitals, and we get overlap directly in between those 1s orbitals. Well, there's two kinds of overlap we can get. We can get bonding uh, uh, constructive interference, and we can get destructive interference. All right, so when we create, when we take those two atomic orbitals, it will form two molecular orbitals. The molecular orbital is going to be lower, the, the bonding molecular orbital is going to be lower in energy than the atomic orbitals, and the antibonding molecular orbital will be higher in energy. We're going to call the bonding molecular orbital a sigma 1s. The sigma means that it's a sigma bond. And the 1s mean it's the type of orbital that we use to make that bond. The antibonding orbital we're going to call a sigma star. We use the special designation of star to indicate antibonding. Help us keep track of which ones are bonding and which ones are antibonding. So these are called sigma molecular orbitals, again, sigma bonds. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, antibonding MO is denoted with an asterisk to make it clear it is antibonding. So this is an MO diagram for hydrogen. The way that MO diagrams work is that on the outside we will put, so on the outside, here where the yellow ones are, we will put the atomic orbitals. On the inside we will put the molecular orbitals. So the atomic orbitals come together to make these molecular orbitals. For every two orbitals we put in, we're going to get one bonding molecular orbital and one antibonding molecular orbital. All right, so here is, this one's for hydrogen, our MO diagram for hydrogen. And uh, the 1s orbitals, they combine together to make these two molecular orbitals, the sigma 1s and the sigma star 1s. All right, the two electrons on the side, yeah, those are the atomic orbitals, and they combine together to make our molecular orbitals and fill the lower energy 
uh, ones first. So we have to fill this one first before we can fill that. That's thanks to the off valve principle. If we do excite one of those electrons up there, we call that an excited state. This is the ground state. We can calculate something that we call bond order. And this bond order is the same number that you would get if you had like single, double, triple bonds. So uh, it is the bond order. The bond order we will find is equal to half the difference between the number of bonding orbital electrons and the number of anti-bonding orbital electrons. And so if we just use that simple equation, oh yeah, so we'll take those, that difference, divide by two, and that will give us our bond order. In the case of hydrogen, our bond order is gonna come out to, there's two electrons down here in the bonding molecular orbitals, and there's none up in the antibonding, so two minus zero divided by two, and that gives us one. So this would indicate molecular orbital theory would predict a single bond for H2. Now that, you should not take that as evidence that it is uh, a perfect theory. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, if it predicts hydrogen, that seems like that should be a minimum, right? All right, let's look at another thing real quick. We're gonna look at the bond order for a hypothetical molecule that's, that's just helium with two, two helium atoms that come together. So here are our helium atoms. We've got two electrons in this helium, uh, 1s subshell, two electrons here. We end up with four electrons in uh, 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 two orbitals, a bonding molecular orbital, antibonding, and we have four electrons in those orbitals. All right, so there is our hypothetical molecule of He2. Our bond order is going to be equal to two bonding orbital electrons minus two antibonding orbital electrons. So the ones without the star and the ones with the star. So two minus two over two, and that gives us zero. So our bond order is zero. And that means that MO theory would predict that He2 is does not exist. Now again, I wouldn't take that as uh, as evidence that this uh, theory works perfectly, uh, we need some more compelling evidence. But the important thing here uh, is that the bond order, it gives us a mathematical way to describe the statement I made earlier. And the statement I made earlier is that when we put electrons in bonding molecular orbitals, we create bonds. When we put electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, they cancel out those bonds. So to the extent that there are electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbitals, they cancel out the lower energy that we got because of, bond, of occupying the bonding molecular orbitals. So anti-bonding orbitals, uh, um, they sort of destroy our bonding. So that's important to remember. All right, so here we're going to, uh, in this section, we're going to get to more complicated uh, molecular orbital diagrams, and we want to look at sort of our guiding principles. Some of these we've already seen, uh, uh, they should make sense. So the number of molecular orbitals formed equals the number of atomic orbitals combined. So however many orbitals you put in, that's how many MOs you're going to get out. It's sort of like a conservation of orbitals. Atomic orbitals combine with other atomic orbitals of similar energy. If the atomic orbitals are too far apart in energy, they won't interact. They need to be of similar energy. The effectiveness with which two atomic orbitals combine is proportional to their overlap. So the better the overlap, then uh, um, the better the bonding, right? So, so the better the overlap, the better the bonding. Also, the better the overlap, the better the anti-bonding. So, uh, um, so that's definitely a consideration as well. All right. In the ground state, electrons occupy the lowest energy molecular orbitals first before occupying the higher energy orbitals. So the off valve principle applies to molecular orbitals. Each molecular orbital can accommodate at most two electrons and they have to have opposite spin. Well, that's just a statement of the Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli exclusion principle says you can't have two electrons in the same orbital with the same spin. And then finally, 
uh, when m uh, when mo's of equal energy are populated they are singly occupied first with the same spin before being doubly occupied and this is a statement of hun's rule all right so keeping those things in mind we want to uh, look at some more complicated molecular orbital diagrams first let's talk about core electrons so we're going to talk about lithium uh, dilithium which you know who knew that that exists but it just so happens that if you have lithium in the gas phase you can get the li2 molecules those li2 molecules are the overlap of of some orbitals to make us some sigma bonds. The Lewis structure for this lithium is just a single bond in between the two lithium atoms. All right, well here is the molecular orbital diagram. You'll notice from the molecular orbital diagram we've got the 1s orbital down here and then it goes up and down for our sigma and sigma star and there's our other 1s and then those are completely filled. And then our 2s orbitals are higher in energy, and then they interact to give us a sigma and a sigma star. And so we get electrons in the sigma, but not so much in the sigma star. Well, notice that um, in the MO diagram that those core electrons, the level 1 electrons, they don't really make much of a difference. As long as, our, as, long as those are full outer shells down there, when, they, when we start combining these, we're going to end up with uh, a, a bond order of zero thanks to the level one. So our level one interactions are, you know, our uh, yeah, level one interactions aren't going to be as important as the outer shell. So we can pretty much ignore core electrons when we're looking at this. We can just look at the valence electrons with MO diagrams. All right, so. The molecular orbitals uh, for p orbital overlap. So I mentioned this, the p orbitals can overlap to create molecular orbitals. And when they do, they do it in two ways. And we've already seen these two ways. The two ways are head-to-head -head overlap and side-by-side -side overlap. When we get head-to-head -head overlap, we'll get sigma bonds. When we get side-by-side -side overlap, we'll get pi bonds. And remember, we only see pi bonds in situations where we have multiple bonds. All right, so here, um, here are the, here are what the orbitals look like. Now, this looks really confusing, but it's not really that bad. Each atom has three atomic orbitals, the P, Px, Py, and Pz. And so the Px, the Py, and the Pz, when you bring them together with another Px, Py, and Pz, that's six atomic orbitals, so we'll end up with six molecular orbitals. Three of them will be bonding molecular orbitals, and three will be antibonding molecular orbitals. When we get the head-to-head -head overlap, we'll get sigma bond, and of course the sigma star. When we get side-by-side -side overlap, we'll get a pi bond, and here's the pi star. And then this one's perpendicular and equal in energy to this one. And so here we're, we're going to get uh, a, a pi bond and a pi star as well. So now we want to look at what this looks like in an energy diagram. So this is a molecular orbital diagram for a period two P block element. Now, not all P block period two P block elements are going to look exactly like this. And I'll explain that here in a moment. But, uh, but we have uh, uh, each, each atom has a 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals. And so it, each one is contributing four valence orbitals. So four valence orbitals plus four valence orbitals, uh, that means that we're going to have eight molecular orbitals. So we'll get eight total molecular orbitals Four will be bonding, and four will be antibonding. Just as a reminder, the ones that are bonding don't have a star, and the ones that are antibonding do have a star. So we'll have a sigma, a sigma star, a sigma, two of the pi, pi two pi stars, and a sigma star. All right. The 2s interactions are lower in energy than the 2p, so here uh, uh, these usually get filled up pretty quickly. 
and we'll get the sigma and the sigma star. The head-to-head -head sigma interactions are stronger, and so the, uh, the bonding molecular orbitals are lower in energy, uh, than the, and the antibonding orbitals are actually higher in energy. So again, the head-to-head -head overlap, that's this one. That's where the, uh, the PZ orbitals overlap. So this is stronger than the pi bonds. And so it goes lower in energy, but to the extent that this one goes down in energy, this one has to go up in energy. And so that's why they are in that particular order. Now, there's also something interesting that happens when, uh, when we're on the left side of period two P block, and that's going to include boron, carbon, and nitrogen. Since those atoms, even though they have smaller numbers, those atoms have bigger uh, um, they have bigger radii, and the reason they have bigger radii is because their effective nuclear charge is smaller, and I don't, have we talked, yeah, we talked about effective nuclear charge. So their effective nuclear charge is smaller, so they have bigger radii. Well, when that happens, your 2s orbital interacts better with the, the pz orbital, the 2p orbital, on the other atom. And when you get that extra interaction, it changes the energies of our molecular orbitals. So instead of getting the normal order, which was sigma, sigma star, sigma, pi, pi star, and sigma star, instead of getting that normal order, you will get uh, sigma, sigma star, and then you'll get the two pi's, and then the, sig and then the pi, uh, sigma, and then you'll get the normal pi star and sigma star. I mentioned that. Uh, it causes the energy of this sigma bond to go up and the energy of this sigma, sigma bond to go down. So that's what this is saying. It raises the energy of the sigma 2p and lowers the energy of the sigma 2s. All right, and the px and the py orbitals remain unchanged, so our pi bonds don't change as a consequence. All right, so this is a lot of information on one page, but this is looking at each of the diatomics as you move across the periodic table. So uh, three of these are real, and two of them are things that you wouldn't normally see, you wouldn't normally observe. So boron, so B2, this is not something you typically are going to run into, but uh, you could form uh, uh, bonds, and when you do, you will end up getting, and again, these two are flipped, so you'll end up getting uh, uh, two singly occupied orbitals. When you do the bond order, which is the number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals, so four minus two divided by two, that's going to give us a bond order of one. You'll see the bond enthalpy is uh, 290 and the bond length 1.59. On this one, you'll get uh, 6 minus 2 divided by 2. That will give us a, a bond order of 2. You'll see the bond enthalpy is larger, and the bond length is shorter. Similarly, with the nitrogen, we'll now have 8 minus 2. 8 minus 2 is 6. Divided by 2 is 3. So we get a triple bond, and, uh, and our bond enthalpy is larger, and our bond length is shorter. All right, with oxygen... Uh, now we're getting more electrons. We're going into the antibonding orbitals up here, and we're going to get a uh, bond order of 2. So it'll be 8 minus 4 divided by 2. That'll give us a 2. And then that our bond energy is less than our triple bond, and uh, you'll see our bond length is longer. So multiple bonds tend to be shorter and stronger than single bonds. And then here for fluorine, we'll get... 8 minus 6 divided by 2, that'll give us a single bond. Uh, bond uh, enthalpy, 155, that's pretty weak. And our bond length, 1.43, that's pretty long. And then, of course, uh, Ne2, we don't get that. Now, I haven't talked about what I mean by paramagnetic and diamagnetic. I'm going to save that for the next page here. Uh, um, and so that's why I'm doing that. But let's come back over here. So paramagnetic and diamagnetic. <laughs> What do we mean by those terms? Well, uh, because of the degenerate pi uh, molecular orbitals, Hund's rule applies when we're filling this. 
and as a consequence we have singly occupied orbitals here and so um, so we have unpaired electrons so that we have some unpaired electrons well those unpaired electrons make the molecule paramagnetic so whenever you have unpaired electrons you have a magnetic field that is associated with your molecule and so uh, and that makes it paramagnetic paramagnetic means that it will be attracted to a magnetic field if you put it in a magnetic field it will be attracted to that magnetic field when there are no unpaired electrons as we see in F2 here um, then we'll find that the electrons are are the molecule is weakly repelled by a magnetic field and we say that that is diamagnetic so if it's attracted, it's paramagnetic, and if it's repelled, it is diamagnetic. But the way you tell if it's para or dia, paramagnetic, you have unpaired electrons, diamagnetic, you don't. And that's, that's the key. So this should tell us that oxygen should be weakly, or not weakly, it should be attracted to a magnetic field. And that's true. With paramagnetism in uh, molecular oxygen, uh, we'll see that the MO uh, clearly predicts that oxygen is paramagnetic, and so we should have these unpaired electrons that add together to give a magnetic field. However, in, in uh, gas phase oxygen, we won't be able to really observe this because the interactions are pretty weak. It's not until you take the oxygen and liquefy it and get liquid oxygen uh, um, that you can really observe that it's going to be attracted to a magnetic field. So here we've got a strong electromagnet and then there's some liquid oxygen and when we pour that liquid oxygen into that magnetic field it is attracted to the magnetic field. This is proof that oxygen is paramagnetic and so this is proof that MO diagrams appear to work. Pretty cool. All right. And, uh, and, and it does something that just doing Lewis structures wouldn't produce. Both of these have a bond order of two. If you look at this, or if you look at the structure of oxygen, you would predict a bond order of two, but only the MO theory predicts this paramagnetism. And so that's kind of a big deal. All right, one last page, and then we're done with this chapter. And we're going to be looking at heteronuclear diatomic molecules. With the heteronuclear diatomic molecules, um, um, you know, it's just we have a diatomic molecule that has atoms that are different. And that can change the MO diagram, sometimes just a little bit, and sometimes it can change the MO diagram quite a bit. And so here is one where the MO diagram is shifted a little bit. This is for the molecule nit nitric oxide, NO, no charge. This has an odd number of electrons, so you will observe there's an unpaired electron there. That unpaired electron, that means that it is, uh, it is uh, paramagnetic. Okay, so the atomic orbitals have different energies. So if we look, uh, oxygen is more electronegative, and it's going to have a little bit lower energy than the nitrogen. And since it has a little bit lower energy, then we'll find... Uh, that, that these are, don't have perfect overlap. We will find that they still form a, a bonding molecular orbital and an antibonding molecular orbital. And we'll find that that bonding molecular orbital is closer in energy to the lower energy oxygen uh, orbitals. All right, let's look at number 70. And, uh, and that will be our last problem because after this, that's it. Okay, so using the energy, di energy level diagrams, these are MO diagrams. Let me zoom in a little bit. So using these MO diagrams um, for homonuclear, shown below, we're going to predict the following heteronuclear diatomic ions. So we need to count up the number of electrons. We know carbon is in group 4, and oxygen is in group 6, so 4 plus 6 is 10, but it's a positive charge, so we're going to subtract 1 because of the positive charge. That's going to give us 9 electrons to work with. So when we're doing 9 electrons, off-bow principle says we start at the bottom, so we'll do 1, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, and now we want to uh, let's, we want to predict the bond order. So our bond order is going to be the number of bonding molecular orbitals, the ones without stars, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. Here there are just two, and we'll divide that by two. So that gives us five halves, or 2.5. So our bond order for the CO plus is 2.5. That's something that would be difficult to predict just using the Lewis structure. All right, here we have cyanide. So C, uh, carbon, has uh, four valence electrons. Nitrogen has five. And because of the negative charge, we're going to add one more. So four plus five plus one, that gives us ten. So let's put those electrons into, uh, into these orbitals. Again, start at the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, I'm following Hun's rule there. 9, 10. All right, so as far as our bond order goes, our bond order uh, uh, will count the electrons in bonding. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So 8 minus these two that are in antibonding over 2. So that's 6 over 2. That's equal to 3. So we would predict a triple bond for cyanide. And in case you're curious, cyanide looks like this. And then there's a negative charge on that carbon. So that one does have a triple bond. Okay, and then I just realized that I, we didn't do the magnetic behavior on this one. So this one has an unpaired electron, so this one would be paramagnetic. And then this one has no unpaired electron, so this one would be dia. Try that again. Diamagnetic. All right, so here we've got NO+. Plus. Let's count up the electrons. Nitrogen has 5, oxygen has 6, so 5 plus 6 valence electrons. And then we have a negative charge, so we're going to add one more. That gives us 12 valence electrons to work with. So we'll start down here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right. Now, is this paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Well, because of the unpaired electrons there, we're going to call that one paramagnetic. And now let's do our bond order. And for our bond order, the number of electrons in bonding molecular orbitals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Again, you're just looking for the ones without stars. So 8. The number in antibonding, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 8 minus 4 over 2. That's 4 over 2. That's 2. So we would predict a double bond. And so here for NO minus, if we look at what we get when we did the Lewis structure, All right, so there is our Lewis structure, and here we have a negative charge on the nitrogen. Uh, it predicts a double bond, uh, so we have a bond order of two, predicts a double bond. So Lewis structures do pretty good here in predicting that double bond, but the Lewis structure would not predict this, dia, uh, this paramagnetism. So that is an advantage of MO theory. All right, oxygen has six. Uh, chlorine has seven, and then we'll get one more because of the negative charge. So six plus seven plus one gives us 14. And now let's start putting the electrons in. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I almost went out of order there. So uh, that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14. All right, and it's, let's go ahead and predict the magnetic behavior. Since there's no unpaired electrons, we're going to call this diamagnetic. Okay, 
And now to predict the bond order. Our bond order, so uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, over 2. Uh, that gives us 2 over 2. We'll get a single bond. And if we look at the actual structure, the Lewis structure, OCL, it has a single bond as well. That's the hypochlorite ion. All right, well, that is the end of chapter nine. That also means this is the end of, uh, of all the lectures for chemistry 1411. So hope you enjoyed the lectures.